Welcome back to The Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases and UK true crime. This week we are exploring the case of Georgina Davis in Higher Broughton, Salford in 1986. Georgina was 72 years old and lived alone with her dogs at the time of her death. On first glance at the scene, police believe that Georgina died from natural causes. However, on closer inspection, this did not appear to be the case. This episode contains descriptions that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. Georgina Davis was known as Jean to all her friends and neighbours, and she lived on Mildred Street in the area of Higher Broughton in the city of Salford. Broughton is located just one mile from the city of Manchester and is a busy place today, with many people moving into the area for its ease of commute into the city centre. Jean had lived there for many years and was known in the local community. Her neighbours described her as a very nice lady who was house proud. She could often be found tending to her garden and it was known that she kept her house spotless inside. One of the other things that her neighbours knew about her is that she had dedicated her life to her profession. Jean was a nurse who had previously worked at a facility called Broughton House, which was a home for disabled servicemen, located not far from where she lived. She had worked her way up to matron of the facility, however by 1986 Jean was 72 years old and had retired from this role 18 months previously. She had however not stopped working and continued to see patients on a part-time basis, despite being retired. Jean lived alone as her husband had passed away 14 years earlier. She spent most of her free time caring for her two dogs. She had a love of animals and treated her dogs like important members of the family. Many residents in the area would often see her with her dogs on the racecourse that was located just 150 yards away from her home. It was known that she took them for walks once or twice a day, depending on her work schedule. Jean was known to be quite a private person and she did not seem to socialise too much with friends or acquaintances. She was known, however, to have a drink with some friends at the local pub called The Griffin, which was only around 75 yards away from her home. They would meet on Tuesday nights and if she wasn't working, Jean would often join them for a drink. She had quite a set routine and neighbours and local residents enjoyed speaking to her whenever they saw her in the street or at the racecourse with her dogs. On the afternoon of Wednesday the 21st of May 1986, Jean was due to be at work, however she did not turn up for her shift. This was very unusual for her and it made those that she worked with concerned. Jean was usually very punctual and reliable and would never just not turn up without letting someone know. Her employer rang her house, however got no response. After a number of tries on the phone, her boss decided to go out to her home to see if anything was wrong and to check on her. When she arrived at Jean's house on Mildred Street, it initially looked normal, however when she got closer, she noticed that one of the window panes in the front door was broken. This certainly caught her attention and the worry turned into panic. Jean's boss rang the police and they quickly came out to the scene. Officers were unsure what they were going to find in Jean's house, however the fact that the pane in the door was broken suggested that something may have been wrong. Officers entered the house and began searching for Jean or any sign that something was amiss. As they entered her bedroom, they sadly discovered her body. The scene, however, did not look suspicious on initial examination. There seemed to be no obvious signs of violence or a struggle in the house, and Jean's body displayed no indications that she had been attacked. In fact, it looked as though Jean may have simply died through natural causes. This may have been a plausible reason, considering Jean's age and the fact that she lived alone. There was one problem, however. What had happened to the pain in her door if this had simply been a natural death? It was evident from the outset that despite what the scene looked like, police were treating Jean's death as suspicious. They set about examining the house and the objects inside it to try and find any evidence of what may have occurred there. It was later confirmed that the police's suspicion was correct. 
a post-mortem conducted on Jean's body showed her cause of death to be asphyxiation. It appeared that she had died from what police later said was some sort of pressure on her neck. Her body, however, did not appear to have any other injuries, indicating that she fought back, or that there was a struggle. So the question for the police was, how exactly had Jean died, and who could have committed it? While the house was searched for any further evidence, officers began to try and find out a bit more about Jean's life, and her movements before her death. They canvassed the area and spoke to neighbours. Many were shocked that Jean had passed away, and wanted to help find out what had happened. They managed to track down witnesses who had seen her the day before her body was found. Police realised that her last movements were somewhat patchy, however they were eventually put together by investigators and documented on a Crime Watch episode. On Tuesday the 20th of May, the day before her body's discovery, Jean was following her usual routine and had decided to take her dogs for a walk on the race course. Witnesses who saw her did not think anything of it as she was a regular there. After taking her dogs for a walk and spending some time with them, she walked back towards her home. A witness, Michelle Busky, saw Jean as she walked with her dogs at around 4.15pm. Michelle explained that she had been to the post office and decided to cross over the road to speak to Jean. They chatted as they walked and Michelle would later state that Jean seemed her usual self friendly and sociable. Michelle arrived back at her home and said goodbye to Jean and watched as she walked off in the direction of her house. Michelle stated that she believed Jean's plans were to also go home. It's not known whether Jean did go straight home however as she was not sighted again until nearly two hours later. Another witness, Jean's neighbour Anona Turner, was arriving home in her car at around 5.45 to 6pm that evening. She explained that she remembered it as it had been raining and it was very murky and dark outside. She got out of her car and became aware that a car had passed behind her as she locked the door. When she turned around she realised that it was Jean's metro. She noticed that Jean had parked further down the street on the other side of the road. She pulled up and got out and as she did an owner said that Jean looked angry and in a bad mood. Anona said she remembered this as she thought to herself that it didn't look like the right time to start up a conversation with her. Anona went into her driveway and into her house and saw that Jean also went inside her house. Around three hours later, another witness explained that they had visited Jean's home. Peter Chapman told police that he had been walking his dog on the race course and had decided to call to Jean's house to ask her if she wanted to go to the pub that night. It was a Tuesday and the day that Jean would regularly go to the Griffin. He explained that by the time he arrived at Jean's house it was around 9 o'clock. He went up and knocked on the door. He said he also banged on the window and as he described it made a lot of noise to make sure she knew it was me. Despite the fact that he banged on the door and windows quite hard he received no response. He said that when she didn't answer, he assumed she must be at work and decided to leave it and go home to get changed. He explained that when he went home, he fed the dog and got changed before leaving again and going to the Griffin. He confirmed that Jean did not join them in the pub that evening. At around midnight that same evening, another neighbour was passing by Jean's house. It's reported that as they were passing, they noticed that a light was on in Jean's spare bedroom. This was unusual, and the reason why the witness spotted it as they were passing. This was the last witness sighting of anything to do with Jean until the boss visited Jean's home the next afternoon. It would appear that several people had seen Jean the day before, however there were some definite gaps in the timeline that could not be explained. On the Crime Watch episode, Chief Superintendent Jim Patterson spoke to the public about what he knew about the murder. He once again reiterated that there were no signs of violence or a struggle in the home. However, they now knew that some items were indeed missing and had seemingly been taken from the home. He explained that a set of keys had been taken which included a Yale and Mortis key. He also stated that a handbag, a pair of green wellies and a blue cagoule style jacket with a stripe down the side of it were also missing. 
the jacket was an important piece of evidence in the investigation, as it was believed to be what Jean had been wearing on the Tuesday, the last day she had been seen by witnesses. Aside from this, however, nothing else of value had been stolen from the home, and the items that were missing were quite perplexing. Why would someone want to take a jacket, wellies, a handbag and some keys? It appeared as though whoever had committed the crime had taken things personal to Jean, rather than things of any substantial value that were contained in the house. Some new information about Jean's life and routine did, however, emerge through conversations with local residents. The local butcher who owned a shop facing the Griffin pub was able to provide police with some important information about Jean's regular routine. He told police that once a week he saw Jean standing on the corner outside his shop. He was unsure which day of the week this usually was, however told the officers that it may have been a Tuesday, Thursday or Friday. He did stress, however, that he saw her every week and that it was a regular occurrence. Jean would wait on the corner and then the butcher would see the same black Ford Escort A-registered car pull up. Depending on whether the lights were on red or green when the car arrived, it would either pull up outside the shop or on the opposite side of the road. Jean would get in and it drove off in the direction of Great Clue Street, a street which if followed directly would lead into Manchester City Centre, amongst other places. The butcher confirmed that Jean was usually well-dressed when she met this person, and when asked on the Crime Watch episode if she could have been seeing a patient during these meetings, Chief Superintendent Patterson said no. He stated that as she was well-dressed, he did not think she was meeting a patient, and this may well have been more of a social occasion. The difficulty was that many of Jean's neighbours and acquaintances knew nothing about this person, and it was known that she kept her private life to herself. This was obviously a regular social occasion and it was clear that she kept it quite strictly every week. Chief Superintendent Patterson appealed for the owner of the vehicle to come forward in the hope that they may have some vital information about Jean's movements. The butcher didn't know, however, which day these meetings usually took place on and it's not clear if he indicated that he saw her on the day that she had been murdered. This was an important line of inquiry and something that the police put a lot of effort into finding out. There were a few other aspects of Jean's life that police wanted to find out more about. It was stated on the Crime Watch programme that despite her regular routine, she had not been going to the Griffin pub on a Tuesday as she regularly did. For a few weeks before her death, Jean had not been seen by her friends in the pub. It was unclear why she had not been, however her friends had said that if she was working, she would not always be available to go in. Chief Superintendent Patterson explained that her absence in the pub could be something to do with her job, but that he had also heard that she may have been employed at other places as well. The police were clear that they were unsure if this was the case, and they didn't know anything about these other possible jobs, but they were hoping to find out more. They appealed for anyone that may know something about her possible other employment to come forward. Chief Superintendent Patterson also stated that her absence at the Griffin could have been something to do with the black escort that had been picking her up. However, this connection was also unclear. As Jean's life was largely private, it was important that the police try and find out as much information as they possibly could about her. They appealed to the public for anyone that knew her to come forward and speak to them. They explained that they were looking for anyone that was friends with Jean, anyone that had possibly employed her or worked with her, or any of her patients that may be able to shed some light on her life or her movements on Tuesday the 20th of May. Chief Superintendent Patterson said that he was particularly interested in finding out where Jean was between the hours of 4.15 and 6pm as it was known that she was out of the house and the investigation had not uncovered where she was. Witnesses had been very useful to the investigation and there had also been a sighting outside of Jean's house that needed to be looked into. It's reported that around 7am on Wednesday the 21st of May, the morning after she had last been seen, two men were spotted outside her house. The men were both wearing blue boiler suits and had a van parked nearby. 
The reason for the police interest in these men was because they seemed to be looking at Jean's house. The police stressed that it was important that these men were traced as they may have further information that could be useful to the investigation. Officers were very open and honest about Jean's case, explaining that they had found out very little about her life that could help them and her murder was very much a mystery. The Crime Watch episode aired in July 1986, two months after the murder, and it was hoped that following on from the reconstruction, tips would come in relating to it. Unfortunately, it would appear that no further progress was made on the case. In fact, the only real concrete information I've been able to find out about it is from the Crime Watch reconstruction. Newspaper articles have mostly drawn a blank, and sadly it would appear that her case has been forgotten about with the passage of time. I have not been able to find out anything about any other investigation or cold case inquiry that has been conducted into the murder over the years, and I am saddened to learn that. What did happen to Jean that night? In a way, I feel particularly close to the case, mainly because my family are actually from Broughton, and therefore I know the area well. I was lucky enough to be able to speak to my nan about this case as she lived in the area in 1986 and she was also surprised that she had not heard about it even at the time. It would appear that there was not much publicity about it locally either. The case is mysterious mainly because there's so little known about Jean. She lived alone and was relatively private about her life. Therefore those around her would not have known what she was doing on a regular basis or where she may have been going. It's clear that a huge part of Jean's life was her work, and this took up a lot of her time. However, in her private life, what did she enjoy doing, and where did she go? The scene itself is also strange. Jean was found in the bedroom and had died from some sort of pressure to her neck. However, how exactly had she been killed? One thing that bothers me about the scene is the broken pane of glass in the door. This indicates that someone forced entry into the home, however Jean was found in the bedroom. Had she been sleeping at the time? I have mulled over whether Jean had voluntarily let the person in because she either knew them or trusted them to visit her home, and the glass had been broken afterwards in order to make it look as though there had been forced entry. This would match with the fact that nothing much of any value was stolen from her home. There is also the possibility that someone did break in through the door and attack Jean while she was in the bedroom, however there was no struggle indicated at the scene. There is also the question of when this occurred. Peter Chapman, the witness, indicated that Jean did not answer the door at nine when he knocked on. He didn't state that the pane was broken at that point, so the house must have been secure at that moment. Why did Jean not answer? Had the murder already occurred? Was the killer still inside the house, or was she out somewhere, like Peter assumed? It was clear that someone was in the house at midnight, as the spare bedroom light was on, which was unusual for Jean. There are so many questions, including why the killer had taken the items he did. Had they taken her clothing and boots for a reason? Were they related to the murder? I'm afraid that these are all questions that I cannot answer as there's a limited amount of information to work from. I think Jean's case deserves more attention, as I feel that she's been forgotten about, and there are many elements about it that bother me. I would love it if this episode triggers someone's memory of the time, the place, or even of Jean herself, which could finally get it solved. If you do know anything about Georgina Jean Davis's murder in 1986, please contact Greater Manchester Police on 101. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I would like to thank June's Journey for once again sponsoring this episode. And if you're interested in playing the game, which I'm sure you are, then download it for free from the App Store or Google Play, or by clicking on the link in the show notes. Thank you to all of our patrons for your amazing support of the podcast. If you'd like to have a look at what we offer, including bonus episodes, ad-free early access and stickers and shoutouts, take a look at the link in the show notes. I also have another huge thank you to give this week, and that's to all the amazing people who've been reviewing the podcast from around the world. I have been blown away by the positive and kind comments recently, so I want to thank the people who've taken the time to give the five-star reviews, HLK10 and Miss Mockingbird. 
please do connect with me on social media on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. Or you can send me case suggestions or just general comments and questions to my email at theunseenpod at gmail.com. I hope you can join me again next week as we delve into another case. And as always, I'm Caprice and this has been Unseen. Thank you.